Um, and, uh, Hi, Kathy. Welcome to our Thursday book launch. My name is Malika Albrecht, and I've been lucky enough to be doing this. Uh, it was weekly for about a year and a half, and now we're going every other uh, week. And tonight is my dear friend who I'm so excited to celebrate with. We also get to celebrate her birthday. If you don't already have the book, when there were horses, Pat Revere Seal. I hope you can see that. We do have in the um, chat section a direct link to Main Street Rag if you don't already have a copy. Um, I'm super excited tonight. I'm not going to talk a lot. I am going to say a brief few things about Pat. Um, author of three poetry collections, including Nothing Below But Air. And we were just talking about her cousin, Chris, who's here. And she did the cover for that one, correct? Yes, yes. That's that was awesome. the other one of the other paintings. That's awesome. And then the serial killer's daughter, which won Roanoke Chowan Award. She taught for 15 years at UNC Asheville, Great Smokies writing program. She also served as the North Carolina Poetry Society Distinguished Poet in the Western Region. Can you imagine how many people were so happy to study with her between 2016 and 2018? In 2017, she received the Charlie Award from the Carolina Mountains Literary Festival. If you've never been to that literary festival, Pat and I can both attest to it's fabulous. It's just such a great, and now y'all live right in Birdsville. We do, right? and yeah. you have big fans here in Malika too. They're still talking about you. Oh, really? Yes, I had such a blast there. I like it oh. made me want to move there right away. Well, it was such it was probably one of the most um, like gracious, easy places to be. And it was a fabulous. Um, I mean, everything, every venue was amazing. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it right over to you, Pat. <laughs> I hope you're prepared. But I do want to say one thing. Um, this week was her birthday. So um, I wish that we could just go ahead and say happy birthday, Pat. Make this <laughs> an amazing year. Thank you. This is my Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. I'd sing for you, you, but that'd be a bad experience for everybody. <laughs> I'm going to make a spotlight. It's all you. It's on me. Okay. I've got this band. Okay. Thank you, Malika. This really is a treat to be here with all of you. And thank you all for coming. I'm much as I love in person gatherings, these Zoom meetings make it possible to reconnect with people in Florida and all, all over who might not have made it to an in-person meeting. This was a really hard book for me to write. I wrote these poems during a five or six year period after my last book came out in 2014. And it was a period of um, really deep loss, tremendous change. Um, and there were times that I really wondered whether I would survive it, but I let the ghost in and I let the voices that needed to be heard have their say. And I tried in these poems to weave the joy and the sorrow, the love and the loss and the death and the desire into this collection. And more than anything else, these poems are love poems. So I thought it would be appropriate to begin this with a poem that began in a place that, I, that is very dear to my heart that I love and that's Weymouth Center in Southern Pines. Not only does Weymouth Center provide uninterrupted time to write, but the center is located in acres of gorgeous woods and trails that you can explore and wander and just get lost in. So this first poem is called <laughs> Wander until you find the trail back. How insistent the world wakes you. Daylight pushes through dense blinds. A one note bird insists on an answer. Always the same pulsing, waking, wanting to know what next. How to parse a life caught in mid flight. The light a web woven in the night. All the things we never talk about. We let the stories we tell ourselves define us. What would we be without the myth? Desire contains ire. D as in deconstruct. Dismantle the dire. Desire nothing. Construct your own lifeline. 
getting lost may be the last best thing that ever happens. Many of these poems, well, many, several of them came from dreams. And the first poem in the book is one of those dreams. It, at the time, the dream seemed like an important dream to me. And it's one of those things that just kept tugging at me until I had to write it. And the poem is titled Into the Night. The chestnut mare rests her chin on my left shoulder, nuzzles my neck with her velvet nose as I stroke her forehead. I know she's fast, but tonight we take our time. She lifts my left ankle with her hoof, breathes out stars that swirl around us while we spin through an unexplored galaxy. I try to read each star's wish. Once when I was 12 years old and horse crazy, I rode my best friend's roan bareback across a meadow, letting the wind tangle my curls, burn my cheeks as I clutched a fistful of mane, urging faster, faster, that girl did not know or care where she was going. Now my dream mare's sun-soaked hay scent calms me. I wake to a peace I have not known. The mare and I still bound, traveling down an unremembered road. I'm gonna continue with a little nighttime another nighttime poem. When I moved to Yancey County in 1992, I lived in an old farmhouse that had no insulation. It had a tin roof that leaked, but the windows were very low to the ground in my bedroom. They were practically ground level. And at night there were windows on two sides. And at nights when there was a full moon, the room would fill with moonlight and it would often wake me up and I would go outside and I would look around and just walk in the grass or lie down in the grass. So I kept developed a pretty intimate relationship with the moon. And this poem could be considered the moon's love letter to the sky. What the moon knows. She knows shadow how to slip behind clouds. She's perfected the art of disappearing. She knows how to empty herself into the sky, whisper light into darkness. She knows the power of silence, how to keep secrets, even as men leave footprints in the dust, try to claim her. Waxing and waning, she summons the tides, whole and holy symbol. She remains perfect truth, tranquility. Friend and muse, she knows the hearts of lovers and lunatics. She knows she is not the only one that fills the sky, but the sky is her only home. Um, I'm gonna move to another poem, well, a poem about home, not really home, but I wrote a number of poems about family in my earlier collection. And I thought that I had finished writing family poems. And then a friend of mine who is also a poet, some of you know, Carol Peters, Carol and I were writing poems together and she challenged, one of the challenges was for us to write a poem about our names. So I decided that's something I hadn't written about. So this is, this poem is called Stability. My mother named me after herself, Susan, the name she never shortened, like mother, never mom or Hara, mommy. A nurse, she preferred the formal. Slang, nicknames, anathema, crude, or maybe just imprecise. 
She carefully measured ingredients in every recipe. If it's a girl, we're going to name her Susan Patricia, mother wrote to her sister, but we'll call her Pat. I never asked why she chose a nickname for her imprecise daughter. Maybe a nod to her desire for a curly redheaded boy like the one she married? Or was it a way to differentiate us? She told me once she'd considered Priscilla as my middle name. Difficult to shorten to anything but fluff. I never ask her why she settled in the cross-gendered path. Single syllable, the name that served me well, allowed an identity that generates assumptions while the moniker remains my three-legged stool. This next poem also came from an exercise when I was teaching at the, um, in the Great Smokies program in Asheville, I had a class and it was, as all classes do, they tend to take on their own culture. And somehow in this class of all women, one day we started talking about the seven daily deadly sins. And I somehow decided it would be a good idea for everybody to write about their favorite sin. One of the seven deadlies. And since I always do the exercises with my class, this was my poem. Can't say that it's always my favorite, but it's right up there. Sloth. I can spend all day in my robe and slippers, foul mouthed and furry tooth, shuffling about the house, or lazing in my favorite wing back, feet propped on the ottoman. This is how I like it, absence of ambition. Summer days you'll find me under the trees, lounging in a hammock, idle and nearly naked. I embrace my laziness. Maybe it's pride that keeps me tethered to the lack of ambition. Too much time to let my mind roam over the far ridge Thoughts settle into the valley of my contentment like morning fog, dense, but not deadly. I'm gonna go back to another poem that um, I wrote or started when I was at Weymouth Center. There's a, there's a lot of these. This one is titled, Everything is Saying Goodbye. Late September, cicada carcasses litter the doorstep. Dusty green leaves turn brown, brittle yellow. The sky, seamless blue silk. Everything is saying goodbye. The woman sporting the long black ponytail hugging the man who steps out of his white Corvette, arms wide, the blonde leaning out the black Bronco's open window, nodding slowly at the man standing beside his silver accord. The white stallion and the chestnut mare graze opposite ends of the paddock, heads bent low, pulling whatever grass remains. They do not know regret. A summer galloping together, nuzzling neck against neck. Will they spend the winter nestled together, stabled with sweet hay? If they should turn to face each other, they would love each other still. Uh, as you all know, we poets tend to steal. We steal, we steal a lot. Sometimes we steal the, the words right out of friends' mouths. And this next poem has an epigraph from one of my dear friends and another terrific poet, Libby Bernadine. 
Libby lives in um, Georgetown, South Carolina, and is a terrific poet. The poem is called A Long Life, and the epigraph from Libby is Sorrows are the price for a long life. My sorrows flock to me like small birds, alone and hungry. They perch on dry stalks, settle in my heart, and refuse to leave until I agree to feed them. I scatter memories like loaves and fishes, each loss recalling all other losses. The slow leaving as a friend disappears into Alzheimer's. Another sudden death while we are making plans. The love that broke me open. The dreams that died from neglect. Deeper still, more ambiguous losses. The way I'm learning to live in a country I no longer call home. If sorrow is the price, then grace becomes the gift. When the birds leave, the comfort of soft feathers remains. I'm going to end with a couple more poems. I said um, Weymouth is a place that I love dearly, and I'm so glad to see Callie joined us. She also loves Weymouth as dearly as I do. One day they're gonna put her to work too. I love that place so much that they decided that I needed to be on the board of directors so I can do a little work for it. So that's one of the things I'm doing these days when I'm not writing poems. But this poem that I got that is the title poem from this book, um, came from a line that just popped into my head one late one afternoon, right about sunset. I like to go out and walk about then. There's nobody else usually around at that time and it's very quiet. And that particular day I was thinking about the time when there were horses stabled in the property and a time when another writer who was in residence with me had stopped her car and a cat who lived at the barn had gotten into her car and she had a terrible time getting the cat out. She wasn't really quite a cat person like I am. <laughs> or she would have just picked the cat up and taken the cat out if she needed to. But the line that started this poem was, when there were horses, there was a cat here. And I always thought I'd start a poem with that. And I did, and it was a terrible poem. And then I started a few more and they were pretty terrible too. So eventually this poem, this, the lines found its way into this poem when there were horses. I miss the hammocks, the teenagers swinging between trees, high pitched laughter, urgent talk, Sometimes at night, their joy would float to the house's open windows. They were so alive, innocent, sweet as freshly caught hay, the future, an unnamed galaxy. Riders still gallop across the field into the woods, but now empty picnic tables replace hammocks along the perimeter. Last week, a man spent two days mowing, mechanical hum measuring the hours. Today, when I walked out near dusk, a black Mercedes parked beside the gate. In the middle of the field, a man and a woman lay on a blanket, feeding each other sun-baked brie spread on a French baguette. Maybe they are lovers who wait until the sun sets, and shed their clothes, offer their bodies to God, desire unbridled. When there were horses stabled here, there was a cat that asked for love the way cats do, running figure eights around your legs, arching her back. I loved like that once. The man said he had always loved me. 
Maybe he had. Maybe he never loved me. It no longer matters what is true. I head back to the house, searching for the car, now lost in darkness. Well, in addition to stealing things, I also like to write in response to other poets, particularly poets that I greatly admire. And one of those is Linda Paston. This next poem is called, titled From the Almanac of Broken Things. And I wrote it after reading her marvelous poem, The Almanac of Last Things. From the Almanac of Broken Things. I choose this earth that breaks my heart again and again. The woods for the way trees bend, fall and return to dirt. I choose the sand dollar, the nautilus that in brokenness find new creation. I choose the favorite doll that no longer cries, loved into silence, into rags. I choose the memory of a stranger's touch that lifted my face above water. Because I did not drown, I choose mourning, the gauzy gray dawn that returns. I choose the once wild Palomino, whose beauty can never be tamed. I choose light from long dead stars that illuminates without heat. I choose March with its promise of, <clears throat> of spring. The warm days that tease, the blizzard that insulates and warms the bulbs, the seeds, all that lies beneath the surface waiting. Thank you. Is that? Thank about you so much, Pat. I'm um, removing the spotlight. If people want to unmute and Yay. clap, I know I want to. <laughs> Oh, you know, having read that, yes, Karen, I, I'm with you on that one. Yes. <laughs> having read your book multiple times, of course, I, I have to tell you, I didn't realize how much I missed your voice and hearing you read them and just how beautiful that was uh, for me. There are tons of comments in the chat section. I will send that to you. So don't feel like you have to read through them now. I'll send it to you. Um, but I did want to go through, you know, a couple of things, several lines, of course, resonated. I love seeing that when uh, the same line multiple poets, you know, have um, affinity for and will come up. I, I, Kelly, that's so sweet. Kelly put my favorite poet, such oh. beautiful work. Mm -hmm. yes. not, not just Kelly. because I love her, but because I love her work. Yeah. Well, Kelly has her debut novel out now, The Girls in the Stilt House. And if you haven't read it, you really need to read it. It is a fabulous Thank you. Thank lyrical you. novel. About she you writes doing. like a poet. <laughs> That's a beautiful thing. I, I love hearing I the Weymouth. Sorry, Kelly, go ahead. I once said that Pat makes everyone who reads her poems feel like she wrote about them. I always feel like that. There's always something in every poem that I so deeply connect with. And that's one of the reasons I love her. I, yes, and I think that that's, you know, something that I saw in the chat section is how deeply uh, people will latch on to a line or something that you say, Pat, and, and that it really means has a deeper meaning. And Hilda said about the same thing that I did. I, I felt that same thing. Hearing these poems out loud gives a whole new dimension. That's lovely. Yeah, that's beautiful. And ah, this line, um, multiple people. Yeah, the I choose refrain was gorgeous. And Karen, like I choose the favorite doll that never cries, loved into silence. So I, I love that you actually did us a huge favor in kind of talking about the, the origins of some of your poems, because I think one of the things we've enjoyed on these Thursdays is being able to ask people about their writing process. So I know that several of them came from like prompts or things like that, but I also <laughs> liked hearing that the actual title poem, it sounds like you multiple times tried to, you know, go when there were horses, 
there was a cat and that those didn't work. And, and, you know, I think just as important as our successes are our failures. Oh yeah. Um, and our attempts, because that's that practice, you know, not everything that we write is uh, going to be something that we bring to light for good reasons. Uh, Christy just wrote, I need this book. Can't wait to read cover to cover. And it is true. You actually do need to, um, we do have a link in the chat section if you go up to the top directly to Main Street RAG. So I'm going to let people ask questions. Feel free to unmute. We're pretty uh, relaxed here. Oh, good. Oh, geez. Malika. <laughs> when, when I was working at Mission on one of the floors, I would, uh, during our lunch break, sometimes I would read some of Pat's poems to the nurses. Now, these are not writers. They're great people. I love nurses, but they don't read a lot of poetry. And so the kind of, and it brought me back to the comment of uh, that someone made about being able to find a connection in her work. And invariably, I would read one of her poems and the nurses would go, wow. Yes. <laughs> you know, I think, Ed, what, um, what you're talking to is what Kelly was saying, that there's a sense that this poem was written uh, you know, to me or for me. And I, I think that's a yeah. beautiful gift that Pat has. Oh, hey, um, Somebody else said something that I missed. No, oh, okay. I just I, I just wanted to say that um, the painting behind Pat is, I believe, from her book "Nothing Below But Air." Yes, correct. And Kathy, we also uh, we have the artist here <laughs> who is um, Pat's. Yeah, Chris, we're back to you. We're going to spotlight you. <laughs> don't feel don't feel threatened. It'll just be a little hot seat. No, I'm joking. <laughs> If you, uh, at the painting behind is indeed uh, from a cover yes. and uh, Chris, we put in her, um, her website, if you're interested in her work. Um, I did want to uh, go back to make sure I didn't miss any questions um, in the chat section. Cause sometimes, yeah. Karen wrote, do we ever finish writing family poems? I loved the one <laughs> about your name, but that's a good question. I don't think we do. Yeah. I don't think we do. I mean, I think we kind of find new new things to write, maybe. Well, and we were talking, Grace, about how you did a review for this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you want to jump in with a comment or insight. Um, well, I just love how Pat, um, her imagination really took off in so many of the poems and that... Um, the banality of reality was transformed, you know, to this dreamlike vision that showed you as a reader that anything is possible, that you really shouldn't accept the mundanity of life. You, you should reach beyond, reach for your dreams. That's that to me, that's thematically what what um, came through for me and I enjoyed poem after poem and I just feel so good I was able to I was gifted to read such a, a beautiful work of art thank you oh Grace, that's lovely and I thank love you, how that's yeah that's beautiful mm -hmm. and I think there is something cumulative that happens with the poems and that there is this sense of um, anything's pop kind of a transformative experience uh, um, mystical to me that uh, really allows a lot of possibilities it's something beautiful I mean it, it you can hold the sorrow mm -hmm. and at the same time have these flights mm -hmm. either up or in that are, are very transformative that's awesome Malika, I'd like to say that not only is Pat a wonderful poet, she is just such a gifted teacher who gives so much. And I had the pleasure of studying with her as a Gilbert Chapel student. And Pat, I want to thank you again for how you pull things out of me that I didn't know were in me as we work some of those poems. And that was when I was working on the book Grit about my sister. So that's why I said, do we ever finish writing family poems? But I'm so happy and congratulations on this last book, Pat. Look Thank forward you. To reading it. it was a joy to work with you because you were such a good poet yourself. 
It was pure pleasure. I was but just Karen, <laughs> That's a lovely insight because uh, not everybody who is a fabulous poet is also a fabulous teacher. And Pat is very generous as a mentor. That's lovely. And I saw Kathy raise her hand and kind of second <laughs> that. <laughs> it's, it's a true story. I want to make sure that if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. We have Pat here, and this is our chance. I'm here. I talk about anything, as most <laughs> of you know. <laughs> well, I'm going to. If you don't want to know, say, don't ask. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to know if, if your book is available here in Yancey County, Pat. Um, it will be available here in Yancey County tomorrow afternoon from 4.30 to 6.30 at Burnsville Wine. <laughs> Other than oh. that, we don't have a bookstore here. Oh, that's awesome. So but I have them. I can have them for sale. Okay. I might, I may email you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Get in touch with me. I'll be happy to sell you a book and um, I'll even give you a bookmark to go along with it. <laughs> I just got a few of the bookmarks. So. Which Thanks. does also remind me, some people really prefer um, having it inscribed. Uh, are you doing mm -hmm. that at all, Pat? Can they reach yes, out to you via email? Yes, I will be happy to do that. Awesome. Do, what's so what, your, I'm trying to put your email address in there. Oh, you want me to put, I can do that in chat. Okay, yeah, if you don't mind, that would be great. Do we have anybody else that would like to um, yes. Yes. jump in? Yeah, this is Carrie. Um, I care. And I, so one of the things that's wonderful about this is to have a chance to see all of the people who surround Pat and Pat surrounds that are in the writing world. I, I have the joy of knowing Pat as a dear friend. Um, and we certainly share writing with each other. Um, but she and Ed and I have known each other, it seems like through at least a couple of lifetimes. Um, and so it's a great opportunity for me to have a chance to see, see everyone and also probably re see some people I've known just through other opportunities that it's been a long time. But I, I just, I wanna say that I'm always really taken back by hearing a lot of poetry at once because everything, there's always something in it that you wanna stick, stay with for a while. So um, a book is good to have, but your, your poem about the moon um, is, it, I just feel like you described so much of how I connect. The moon is very special to me and I will really enjoy just everything that you described about how she knows shadows and that you are immediately referring to the moon as she, um, it just, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that one very much. Thank Carrie. you, Carrie. Carrie has been with me through a lot of those years. <laughs> Carrie, I love your uh, description of how that poem moved you. And I think yeah. that's exactly what everybody was saying is that there's something very personal that a lot of us connect with in, in Pat's words. So that was a perfect demonstration of that. Uh, if there's no other questions, I totally fell down on the job of saying for open mic, please send me your name. <laughs> so <laughs> I failed at that. Um, since we're a very relaxed group, I'm pretty certain that we can just, um, and here's Pat, thank you, Ed, that was lovely. So um, Ed put in the email address where you can ask for your autographed copy of When There Were Horses. Um, so thank you so much for that. And I do know, um, Laura, thank you. So she, Laura's already reached out to me and said, I want to read. Um, we know that if, if there's no other questions, then we'll move to open mic. And I do want to just clap one more time for Pat. Thank you so much. I really needed to hear your voice tonight. Thank so, you. It's so wonderful to be surrounded by so many friends and wonderful poets. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's awesome. Well, Beautiful. we have some people that have books coming out. So I really want to make sure we get to um, people that have books coming out. And then I also am getting a few names here. So thank you all for being uh, helpful. So I'm going to go ahead and go through via the names that I have. And the first one I had is Laura. 
and I will come to you and spotlight you. If you did not want to um, be recorded, please let me know and I will pause it. All right, Laura, I'm coming to you now. Okay, great, I'm up. <laughs> this is a short one. Um, this is called Sequel. The Ministry of Vice and Virtue will now resume the removal of hands for state security. The sports stadium executions are herewith reinstated. The one-eyed minister has spoken. You girls, now encased in black fabric coffins, you cover your face. You stay in the house. You cook family meals. You close your books and you wait for a man to take you to the shop. The one-eyed minister has spoken. Thanks. Holy smokes, wow. girl. <laughs> I do not think I have heard you ever <laughs> read something like that. It's a little different than what Pat was reading, isn't it? <laughs> but it's also a very different thing for, yeah. for you. It's fabulous. And thank you for reading it. This is something new that you're working on? Uh, yes. I like it. <laughs> I look forward to hearing more. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I have... See who do I have next? Joan. And Joan has a book out and will be, I'm coming to you now, will be also featured here at some point. Yes, I have. Um, this is from my uh, book that will be out early next year from Main Street Rag, Carrying Claire. Now available for pre order. Make a wish. Claire has stopped growing. She's too thin, pale from time indoors. A photo from Mother's Day shocks me. John and Claire dressed up side by side in the park in a blue flowered dress, fresh haircut, smiling eight-year-old Claire looks like a starveling. We trust Dr. G with her life. He's a plain speaker. I have his beeper number. He's talked me down late at night, seen her at his house on weekends. I know his wife. So when he says, I think it's time to call the Make-A-Wish Foundation, I believe him. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, do, can you hold up the cover and also remind people mm -hmm. where they can get the book? And you know what, Laura is so nice. She just put the direct connection. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. And you can see the cover there. The book um, hasn't been published yet. But if you click on that link, you can see the cover, which has a really charming picture of Claire at age four. Mm. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, Laura, thank you for putting that link in there. I love when people do that. Um, going from Joan, we now are heading towards Christy, who also has a book coming out, coming your way. Okay, so my book is going to be titled Finding Her, and it will be out through Finishing Line Press in August of 2022. But instead of reading for that tonight, I felt like I needed to read something new. This is called The Etymology of Grief Unfolded. My navel's eyelid flutters as dusk yellows your breath. I wish for you to see starlight. I fear my ears will gurgle as your throat hears silence. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Christy. Mm. Another powerful new poem. Y'all yeah. are on fire, I have noticed yeah. recently. It's a joy to hear. I'm heading towards Betty next. And there you are. I was like, give me a second. All Thank right, you. I just wanted to mention, uh, this is a rework of a poem I did a few years ago, but I'm working on my death arrangements because I like to plan in advance. And uh, my son's coming down next weekend and I'll be discussing everything with him. So this poem came out of that. <clears throat> this is called Sprinkled Places. 
when I die, scatter some ashes over the salt marsh off Cape Lookout in North Carolina. Let me be part of the cord grass, joining life before me in the gentle ecosystem so I can breathe into the tidelands where there are ribbons of sand sinking to sunken ships where pirates hid their captured booty. Then come to Treasure Island, Florida, off the beach at Sloppy Joe's. Mix me with a crushed sand dollar. Our texture will be the same color, white, broken up with my cooked bones. Finally, I want to be sprinkled off of number seven Sumner Road on the Jersey Shore, where I played in the sand as a child near the pilings with blue mussels. Sprinkle me carefully so I can float a bit before my essence settles into the final dark rest. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That wow. was gorgeous. I, wow. Yeah, well, you gotta, you, I hope you're noticing, Betty, people clapping. That was, that was thank gorgeous you. and very powerful. And I very much relate to uh, being a pre-planner. I already have everything written out and sent to uh, my brother and eldest daughter. Um, I'm coming to you, Regina. Where are you? I'm here. Thank you. That helps I, I, when you wave. I can, I see you, and I'm like, okay, spotlight. Yes, yes. All yours. Um, you know, it's it's always uh, interesting to me that um, when um, I'm I see other poets and I hear other poets, um, these themes that have been resonating in my mind even before I've been able to hear what people have to give. Um, it's just, I, I just believe everything's kind of in sync. I said all of that to say, um, Pat's line of, I choose light from long dead stars that illuminate without heat. Um, I, I, I just wrote something about stars in a reflection mm -hmm. that I was having, um, in regards to, uh, people leaving here, these creative people leaving. So I'm going to stop talking because then I'll be crying and then I'll just. This is called Requiem for Poets I Never Knew. Homage to the legacy of Camila Aisha Moon. A poet broke orbit today. I did not know her while she was here, but I am now scouring the galaxy, tracing her light and reading her brilliance. I am studying stars backwards. I am reverse tracking trajectories of light paths towards our planetary coordinates. I stand on unstable space stones because of the faces that I never saw live. Faces that I learned of only in their dying or learned upon their death. My wretched eyes missed the last flickers of these supernova whose lights were withdrawn before I could feel their live heat. I risk lost footing and potential tumble into astral fields of tears when I realize what their words and deeds might have meant or may still mean for me. I am veiled in space lace pulled from black holes. I am singed and blinded by the rising sun. Tides refuse to allow me to stay their moon fraught moods. I am rampantly researching death darkened stars and mourning my loss of ever knowing them their meteoric rise, their connection to the heavens, their real time shine in the world. I will soothe myself by collecting the sediment within their craters, reading their words and writing their names on pages mm -hmm. in the sky. I will do this for the earth gone poets, those who love them and those who miss them while they were still here birthing galaxies. Selah. Yes. Oh, that is wow. awesome. And I have to say, studying stars' trajectories in reverse. Holy smoke. That's yeah. gorgeous. Mm. That's gorgeous. That's and I cool. want to remind people, when I hear y'all read, I oftentimes think, if you have not been sending a poem in when Wednesday Night Poetry run by Kai Coggin, it's the longest consecutive weekly open mic in the country, I think. Um, but if you haven't 
looked at that or sent something there, please consider doing so. Look up Wednesday Night Poetry on Facebook. Regina, that poem in particular, amazing. Um, David, I'm coming to you next. There we go, I see you now. There we are. Um, I just, um, I just learned that Blue Myers died. I just learned yesterday that Blue uh -huh. Myers died. And uh, I don't know, I guess that was a few days ago. But, and I, I never knew him, but I was a, a devoted fan and friend of Susan Lautermeyer's, his wife, who died in 2017. She was a wonderful person and a wonderful poet. And um, uh, I wrote this poem a couple years after she died. Um, I always associated her with the sea for some reason. She and I, uh, I, I got together with her in South Carolina and somehow we, uh, I just associate her with the sea and this poem is called Sea Creature. I can still hear the echo of the shell that was your life. The sea, the air, the absent flesh. How much walking was done along that sand in sun, in rainstorm, words melding with birds, insistent chirping. Almost nothing was discussed that did not adorn landscape or people. Nothing was signed in history. Waves brought back again and again, possibilities we could not touch. Now I see my own emptiness, its world shape, its coral heart, still not silent, not at rest. Mm. Mm. That's lovely. Mm -hmm. And I had not heard about blue. Yeah, it's on it's on the NCPS website now. Uh, okay. But uh, he he was very generous in, in donating to the Poetry Society. Very much so. Amazing couple. Thank you, David, so very much. I'm coming to Paul, who has a book coming out soon. Uh, I do. Mine will be out uh, next month. So, uh, and in fact, it just last night became available for pre-order and it just went to the printers this morning. So, yay. Um, this this point's from the book, but it's also, uh, Pat said something about bookmarks. I have a bookmark. <laughs> up, 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 it disappeared. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> um, I love it. And this point is actually on the bookmark for, for funsies. Can crows kiss? A wild wind asked me this. A whisper almost hissed, serpent-like. Each hard sea, the clack of beak on beak. Misheard is cheek to cheek. But two calls came later. Wove a braid of rising sharp music that can pass for the tune two crows sing together on the wing. Ah, oh, that's mm. gorgeous. Yeah. I love your, your words yeah. and the language and how you really make yeah. every sound work so well within that poem. That Thank is you. awesome. It's a sound poem. Yeah. I'm headed to Kieran. Where are you, my friend? There you are. I found you. I wasn't sure if I was the Karen or if it was Karen Stewart. Oh, so, and Karen, I'll be coming to you next. I had this one with a C, so I'll come to Karen with a K. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think I have everyone written down. So we'll, we, I'm going to go from Karen to Kathy to Janice to Karen with a K to Hilda. If I've missed you, send me something. Karen with a C, you're on. Oh, I'm on. Okay. Oh, short attention span here. Um, so I'm going to do a, I'm, I'm doing a light poem tonight and I'm doing this because um, Pat, what you were talking about, stealing lines from other people's <laughs> poems in other places. So I've been doing that a lot lately. Um, the Emily Dickinson's festival uh, 
was online tell it slant festival a couple of weeks ago they had a ton of great um, workshops and and one of them was several different poets talking about ways they generate poems when they're just feeling the need to generate a poem and so one of the things they talked about is uh coming up with whatever topic you think might be interesting to write a poem about and then picking a random bit of text from somewhere and just having your way with it so that that's what I did with this this is um and I explain that also because this is not addressed to anyone in particular so that's my disclaimer there uh, how to be a famous poet a fragment poem harvested from Smithsonian Magazine's March 2019 features page. Embrace the power and the passion. Wear your campaign button like a pussy hat. Tell the story of your rise. Revisit America's nearly forgotten lips. Repute inspiration. Stir controversy. Quest for traces of mystery travel and dive into question. Why is the color? Draw on melodies. Electrify, electrify fresh voice. Mm. Ah, yes. Ah. Uh, fun. I'm keeping electrify though. Electrify. Electrify. I kind of like yeah. electrify, electrify better. Yeah. yeah. No, that was fabulous. And there was something the one line about the why, what was the, can you read that again? Oh, why is the color? Thank you. I, that stuck with me in a way that stopped my brain. And so sometimes I have to hear that again. Oh, thanks. I'm I, really liking the rant, taking the random text to a theme and just seeing what happens is really fun. That's very cool. Thank yeah. you for passing along how you how you created that too. That helps. Um, I wanted to let everybody know to order um, from uh, Red Hawk Publications, Paul's new book, um, there's a link in the chat section. So if you do have a new book, please do put the uh, link into the chat section so people can find it. And now I am heading to Kathy. Give me just a moment. This is when y'all realize, oh, she's pretty slow with this. Here I come, Kathy. And I love that. Oh, look, see, she's already ready for me. She unmuted. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. Uh, I had been writing. I, I spent a uh, difficult year caregiving. Um, and I, I, when I came back to writing the first one I've written in a long time, I went back to a notebook from 2015. I was working on, hoped to work on a series about the ancestral house um, that stood in, in Wilmington, Delaware, where my family is from. Um, and I pulled this out. I made, I made sense out of it. It's an old free write. <clears throat> It's called Lesson in Blue. Small is large when you're four and live close to the ground in the musk of loam and leaves. You know how grass blades tickle the gentle progress of ants. Sudden whoop, grasshoppers leap. Below the hydrangea bush by its roots, I find a handful of pennies dirty and dark, cold, still money, a treasure I might keep but must report, was a Sunday school tell me so, and mother. My grandmother washes them in the kitchen sink while I await sugared praise for my honesty. Surprise, she presses the pennies back into my palm, counts one, two, three, four, five, six. Put them back where you found them, she tells me, in the dirt under the bush. They make its flowers blue. Mm -hmm. My known world blurs. What do I know of copper, acids, and bases, pH, when I crawl back under the hydrangea, its bouffant clusters, whirled with tissue paper petals, have become, and still are, clouds in the sky of a blue world, where grandmothers float, knitting a tablecloth to stretch across heaven. Mm. 
gorgeous. Mm. Thank you so much, ah, Kathy. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I hope you heard the sigh that people were, were yes. And I, it reminded me, there was a photograph that recently I saw on Facebook of hydrangeas from underside, and it did look like a cloud. So I don't know if you had seen that photograph recently, but you, mm -hmm. boy, I kind of want to send it to you because it really, your yeah. poem captures oh, okay. that. Okay, I'll send you my email. Would you? Because I really think you need to see this picture. Um, I am coming to Janice next. And let's see, where are you? Wave or something, because clearly I'm having I'm a here. moment. I'm <laughs> here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Woo. All right. Hi, everybody. And if it's not a problem, I'd rather not be recorded, if that's okay, Malika. That is perfectly fine. And I okay. love that people make use of it. I've made use of it. I'm out of the book. I'm going to read a poem out of the book, uh, the, uh, the View Ever Changing, that got published by Kelsey Books a couple months ago. And it's fitting it's coming after the last poem. Um, two things. One, this poem sort of emerged out of an assignment, which was to do a poem about an extended metaphor. And I had just been at the state fairgrounds here in the western part of the state. And unlike Karen with a C, who had her way with the, with the phrases, this poem had its way with me. So it sort of just developed. It's called Midway. He relished the roller coaster, its glacial clicking, swooping dive, couldn't abide the Ferris wheel, her favorite ride. At night, seats stopped on top, lights dazzled the girl he loved. After I do's, they compromised, zigzagged in the scrambler like bees swarming a hive, mounted horses that pulled up and down, metronome hooves pounding time, stumbled through the fun house, she pointing out his Pinocchio nose, he her fat lady belly, lost one another for a time, navigated that maze alone, then belted themselves into bumper cars, side swiped, then rammed each other, and landed in a tilt-a-whirl, swinging side to side, until a full swirl fused their bodies like the night they first danced, like bugs caught in cotton candy. Thank you, Karen. Uh -huh. And uh, speaking of Karen's, thank you, Karen Stewart, for putting in Karen's uh, a, a link to Karen Luke Jackson's newest book with Kelsey Books. And my last and final reader is Hilda, who if you missed her reading, you're gonna get treated to listening okay. to her now. I'm coming to you, Hilda. Thank you. I didn't really mean to read. <laughs> um, I live on, well, I grew up on Highway 80 in Mitchell County. So I think that that's probably the same road that Pat lives off of in Yancey. <laughs> um, this is called Gray Fossil Site. An ancient sinkhole filled with the siren song of water. Come drink, drink, drink forever and ever. We would love to see them alive now. Mastodons, saber-toothed tigers, tapirs, alligators, and rhinos in Tennessee. We hold tight to the railing above the excavation site wind gusty enough to pitch us in. Overwhelmed by the fierce energy, we can still feel them so big and different from us. Here, they left their mark. Each of us has collected fossils and rocks all our lives. My childhood pathways near the sinkhole mine, sparkle garnet, aquamarine and burl, dirty roads flashed mica, bright enough to sting light green eyes with wonder and terror of what forever and ever could mean. We do our research, talk with therapists, 
accept what is hard to accept, what we will never agree upon or understand about the other, when something so big is made of such fragile parts, crystals and fossils beneath, clawing to come out or go deeper. Oh, thank you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone, for reading, for being here, uh, for writing the brave and beautiful poems. Pat, I was so glad to see you. It's wonderful to see you, Malika, and everybody else. I just miss seeing people. Yeah, same. It was good to be in y'all's company tonight. Be well. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Bye, guys.